Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our special virtual performance of Multiverse Concert Series, Unfolding Life. I'm James Wetzel, the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science, and I am thrilled to introduce this incredible group of artists and scientists. However, before I do, as I hope many of you are already aware, last week the Museum and Multiverse participated in Blackout Tuesday pausing all live virtual programming on the museum's platform, including our show with Multiverse. However, that is not the end of our engagement during that, this historic time. Black lives matter, as do the invaluable and historically underreported contributions of the Black community to STEM fields. We will amplify these voices and we stand with our community in Boston. And for tonight, we are back live with our friends from Multiverse. I'm so excited that we can be bringing this incredible collective into your homes. Uh, we first collaborated with the team back in the fall for a sold out performance in the Charles Hayden Planetarium. And I look forward to being able to invite them back on site as soon as we possibly can, but thank them for collaborating with us tonight on this very special digital event. And tonight is a part of our virtual season of adult programming at the museum. Uh, which is a part of our MOS at Home initiative. We have turned the Museum of Science into a virtual museum, offering free STEM-related programming on a daily basis across our digital platforms. And as a part of that, we have launched our subspace adult programs after Dark Channel to host tonight's event and the rest of our upcoming lineup. We still have some fantastic events to come, still to even be announced. So I encourage you to check out that lineup and keep coming back and hanging out with us after Dark. I will be back a little bit later on for a Q&A with the entire team. So if you have questions tonight as they come up, feel free to submit those using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're watching with us through Zoom. I need to thank our friends from the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible and for their continued support of the adult programming at the museum. Without them, we would not be here tonight. This event would not be happening and it would not be free. So please join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause and thanks to the Lowell Institute. I want to thank all of you for being here with us and spending your Tuesday night with us. But now I'm thrilled to turn it over to the show. Please enjoy Multiverse Concert Series with Unfolding Life. Thank you.
Good evening and welcome to Multiverse Concert Series Unfolding Life. I'm David Ibbett, director of the project and the composer of tonight's music. Um, this is an experimental show. We're thrilled you could uh, join us for it. Uh, it's experimental both because it's our first full live streaming program and it's our first time bringing together not two but three scientists from different fields in order to embark on a journey from the world of fluid dynamics through to biology, through to exobiology, joined by live music and dance. Over the course of the evening, join a fluids engineer, a cell biologist, and a molecular astrophysicist to explore the nature of growth and life on Earth and the potential for life on other worlds. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Ermgard Bischoff Berger of the MIT Fluids Lab. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Olga Pischofberger, and I'm very excited to share with you tonight some of the work that we are doing in fluid dynamics in my lab at MIT. So the story I want to tell you tonight isn't yet about life, but it's about something essential to life. It's a story about growth and about how we can learn about growth by looking at fluid instabilities and the patterns they form. So for those of you that are still in quarantine, I thought I'd start this talk by showing you an experiment that you can all do at home. So all you need is two fairly flat plates and a drop of a fluid. For example, shampoo or mayonnaise work wonderfully well. So you then take your drop of fluid and you place it on one of your plates and you use the other plate in order to squeeze the fluid apart. Now, so far, nothing really interesting has happened. The fluid has just spread out uniformly in the form of such a circular disk. However, if you then take the two plates apart again, you're in for a quite beautiful surprise. So you get the spontaneous formation of a fairly complex pattern out of a seemingly featureless environment. So what's going on here? So what we have here is two fluids, our diet drop and the air around it. And these two fluids have different viscosities or different resistances to flow. Now in the first part of the experiment, you took the more viscous fluid, the diet drop, and you displaced the less viscous fluid, the air with it. In this case, the interface between the two fluids remained stable and small perturbations at that interface got stabilized again. Now in the second part of the experiment, when you lifted the two plates, you essentially simply switched the two fluids, such that now the less viscous fluid was invading the more viscous one, and this led to an unstable pattern where small perturbations at the interface could grow into a pattern. Now, in my lab, we study such instabilities in fluids in order to understand how patterns spontaneously form. We want to understand what governs their growth morphology or the type of growth that they are adapting. And we are interested in ultimately learning how to control and tune pattern growth. So what characterizes many pattern forming systems is that a small perturbation in the system can induce growth on a very large scale. And that the growth is often a competition between different forces. Now, I'd like to show you on this example of this viscous fingering instability, what I mean by these two points, small perturbations leading to large scale growth and the growth being governed by a competition of two forces. So we do our experiments in a somewhat more controlled way than the experiment I showed you in the very beginning. We take two glass plates on top of each other, separated by a small gap, and we inject our fluids into this gap and then look from the top how an outer fluid gets displaced by an inner fluid. So I'd like to show you a movie of this process where you see here the first fluid, a viscous oil that is already pumped in into the system. And we're going to start the injection of the less viscous fluid through this black tubing, which in this case is a dyed, uh, dyed water. So 
So you see that the interface becomes unstable, fingers start to form, and these fingers start to grow into a fairly complex pattern. Now I'd like you to focus on the growth of one of these fingers in this red box. Now you see that as this finger grows, it repeatedly splits at its tip, which creates a new generation of fingers and eventually a branched pattern. Now this tip splitting leads to the formation of fingers with a fairly well-defined width. And indeed, we can mathematically express this characteristics width of these fingers, where we see here that it depends on the surface tension between the two fluids, on the viscosity difference between the two fluids, and on the interface velocity. And it is here in this equation that you can actually appreciate this competition between different forces that I told you about previously, where in this case, the growth is governed by the competition between surface tension forces, which try to oppose the growth of the pattern and form round, stable interfaces, and the viscous forces, which drive the formation of fingers. And the balance between these two forces is what sets the characteristic length scale of the pattern. Now, small perturbations of this specific characteristic length scale will then start to grow, and the growth occurs by repeated splitting of the tips of these structures, where a new generation of fingers appears each time the finger has grown to a width two times that characteristic width. So this type of growth governed by repeated splitting of the interface leads to this branching pattern and to a fairly disordered and random type of growth. Now, David has challenged me last night with an excellent question. He has asked me, what can we learn by looking at the growth in these fluid instabilities at, about biological growth? And this is a very, very interesting question. And so I think I can only speculate, but what is remarkable is that we see these same types of branching pattern being selected over and over again in nature and biology. We see such branching growth in trees, in river networks. We see them in biology in the human lungs or in blood vessels. And nature takes advantage of these structures because they provide an optimized surface area with respect to the volume of the structure. Now, the other thing I believe we learn from looking at these fluid instabilities about growth in general is this competition between different forces governing the growth. The balance between the different forces is different for each of these systems, but the fact that these balances are what select the scale for the growth is common to many pattern forming systems. So clearly though, nature can do much more than just branching patterns. It has many more tricks and in particular, it can create very ordered and symmetric patterns. The snowflake is an example of such a symmetric structure. The six-fold symmetric flakes that we are all familiar with solidified alloys grow by ordered growth, leading to what we call dendritic patterns. So do many copper oxides. And so the one key thing that needs to happen for a system to form by this dendritic growth, rather than the branching type, is that this Tip splitting, this ubiquitous tip splitting we observe in many systems needs to be prevented in order to instead allow the formation of stable tips and the growth of needle-like structures. So the key ingredient that allows for the stabilization of these tips is anisotropy in the growth dynamics. So the growth has to become directionally dependent in order to transition to dendritic growth. Now, we can study such dendritic growth as well in our fluid instabilities. And we have several means to introduce anisotropy into the system. The easiest one is to introduce it into the growth environment. 
by engraving ordered channels on one of our plates, where these channels then modulate the plate spacing and become the preferred growth direction. This simple modification to the structure dramatically changes the growth. So for a system that on, in smooth plates grows by this typical branching type of growth, now the same two fluids under the exact same condition in this anisotropic environment transition to dendritic growth. There's a second more elegant way how we can introduce anisotropy to the system, which is by not doing it to the growth environment, but by using an intrinsically anisotropic fluid. We here use liquid crystals, which are rod-like molecules that can align on the flow such that all the molecules point in the same direction. Now the flow properties depend on the direction of the flow with respect to the alignment of the molecules. The viscosity experienced is much lower or the flow much easier if the flow is in the direction of the alignment rather than perpendicular to it. And this again gives us a way to introduce anisotropy and to transition to the stable needle-like structures characteristic of dendritic growth. So by looking at these fluid instabilities, we can learn about these transitions from branching growth to dendritic growth. We can identify the control parameters for growth and the types of patterns that result from instabilities. And we can ultimately learn how to gain control and predictive power over pan formation. So this ends the scientific part of my talk. But I'd like to take a moment to introduce the next piece. It's a piece called Dendritic by David Ibbett, where David has taken, I think, his favorite of our instability movies. And we have then taken a snapshot of the pattern and generated evenly spaced points around the interface of the pattern in order to clearly identify the fingers and the side branches. My student Ching now plots the distance of each point off from the center of the image around the interface of the pattern essentially unfolding the structure, which allows us to again very clearly identify the side branches and the fingers in our patterns. Now, David has taken this data and has made something truly amazing with it. And so David, I hand it back to you. Thank you so much, um, guards, and I wish we were able to applaud you. Uh, for your wonderful talk. Uh, well, you're, you're too kind, but um, you can see, um, I'll let the piece speak for itself, uh, but you can see we, ha we have many ways of connecting uh, art and science, and the conversation between art and science is very much ongoing and, and taking new forms and new languages um, all the time. Uh, but you'll see that this piece is a very direct connection. It uses this method called sonification, where we take data and we turn it into sound. Um, and because we have this uh, rising and falling um, distance uh, from the center, uh, we're able to uh, convert that into a kind of a melody. Uh, so that's what you'll see there. Oh, it looks, if anyone is a musician out there, that's a melody that's quite difficult to play. It kind of goes all over the place. Um, so that's why we use a synthesizer uh, in this piece. Um, and you'll hear it uh, in just a second. Thank you so much, Ermgard. Um, there is also uh, a live, well, almost live component to this piece. Uh, it features soloist uh, Jesse Christensen, uh, cellist. Um, it's been recorded within a week, so we'll, we'll call that live, uh, live from Jamaica Plain. And I also want to thank so much Jason Fletcher of the Charles Hayden Planetarium who did the, the visuals. Um, I want to say uh, just one more thing about Ermgard's work. And we've worked with her a number of times with Multiverse. Um, and the more we do, uh, the more inspiring it is because it gives us a way to look at the everyday world of fluids, which maybe we don't think about too much and in imbues it with a, a deeper sense of a wonder for the natural patterns that surround us. So I'll uh, 
introduce the piece. This is Dendritic, a fusion of fluid dynamics, music, and digital animation.
my name is Meg Anderson, and I'm so honored to be here presenting live dance for you all during this pandemic. It's such an honor to be here, and I'm so grateful. Um, I'm going to present a piece of a larger work, the larger work entitled Cellular Dance. That was a collaboration between myself, two fellow dancers, Haley Day and Jacob Reagan, and along with composer Dave Nivet and cellular biologist Alexei Baraxka. This small snippet is entitled Organelle, and it really dives into the inner workings of a cell. Those small little organs inside of each cell are called organelles, and that's what we use for inspiration here. I hope you enjoy.
Let's have a big round of applause for Meg. Thank you so much. It's just incredible, inspirational to see uh, dancers and performance artists continuing their work in incredibly creative ways uh, despite the lockdown. You know, we're all having to uh, to find uh, new ways to get our work out, and um, it's very stressful. And uh, there are some things we can't do, but there are others uh, like this event that that I think have have allowed us to create something something new for you, something new to share that we we wouldn't have had otherwise. So, thank you so much, Meg. I should say that the piano in that um, recording was uh, performed by Sophia Vastek. Um, and the drone in the background was a shruti box, which is an uh, Indian traditional instrument. And we used it throughout the ballet to represent uh, the, the tone, uh, the heart of life, the, the life essence. So um, we're now about to delve deep uh, into the world of cell biology. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Alexei Varaksa, cell biologist at UMass Boston. Good evening. Good evening. As we move from beautiful patterns in inanimate matter that we saw in Imgard presentation to life on other planets, which is still awaiting us, I have a privilege of presenting to you a view from living systems here on our planet Earth. I will tell you today about gastrulation, which is a critical step in the life of every animal embryo. This process involves a lot of folding of the tissues. Hence, the title of my talk is Folding Life, the World of a Gastrulating Embryo. Animal development is a fascinating process. We humans all start from a single cell, which gives rise to wonderfully complex organism comprised of approximately 30 trillion cells. Much of this process is still a mystery. And in my lab at UMass Boston, we're trying to understand the rules and principles <clears throat> and principles of how development occurs. We simplify our task a bit by using a model organism in our research, the common fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. It also grows from a single cell, an egg, into an adult that is comprised of a few million cells. You may be surprised, but a fly can teach us a lot about our own development. In flies and in humans, all the major events are carried out by cells that work together to build an organism. After many years of research, we now understand the basic cellular processes involved in development. The cells divide and increase their numbers. They become different from their neighbors. Cells interact and send signals to one another. And they move to create new organs and tissues. The process of gastrulation is a critical event in the life of the embryo. When some cells located on the surface move inside as a group and eventually establish all the internal organs. On the right, you can see a Drosophila embryo undergoing gastrulation. We captured this movie using time-lapse microscopy, and this is a view from the ventral or belly part of the embryo where most of the action happens. As you can see, gastrulation is carried out by many cells working together. But how does each individual cell move? We can get some answers to this question if we take a peek inside the cell. Using special staining techniques, we can visualize that inside the cell, we see cable-like structures that crisscross uh, the cell. These elements are together called the cytoskeleton. They provide mechanical stability for a cell and allow it to move. On the right, you can see cytoskeletal elements in this cell labeled with a red fluorescent dye. And you can appreciate that these structures are very dynamic. They're constantly built and destroyed inside the cell and they allow the cell to navigate its environment. 
Going back to gastrulation, we saw that this process involves many cells moving in concert, if I can use this musical metaphor. The cells that are close to the midline of the embryo must contract and then sink inside. And a few of their neighbors then have to do the same. How do they do that together? There must be some organizing influence, or if I may say, a cellular conductor, to continue a musical analogy. We now know that this is accomplished by molecular signals that are sent by the cells in the middle of the embryo to their neighbors, and then the neighbors also communicate back. The main signal that organizes gastrulation in Drosophila is a secreted protein called FOG, which is short for folded gastrulation. This signal binds to a receptor located on the surface of the cell called MIST. The binding of FOG to MIST starts a whole cascade of events that activates the cytoskeleton, allows the cells to contract, and eventually leads to gastrulation. Okay, seemingly we understand the whole process right now, but there is one remaining question. Question, how do the cells know when to stop? This is an important problem for the embryo because only a few cells are destined to move inside. Well, our research has identified another protein called KERTS, shown in purple here, that functions as a molecular brake uh, uh, and keeps mist activity at just the perfect level. So we can say that Kurtz prevents runaway gastrulation from happening. And now I want to show you what happens in a fly embryo that does not have Kurtz. At the top here, we have a video of a normal embryo. It is happily gastrulating with only the cells along the ventral midline moving inside. At the bottom is the video of a Kurtz mutant embryo. As you can see, almost every cell in the embryo is trying to contract, and unfortunately the embryo then literally rips itself apart. From this example, I hope you can appreciate how important are the molecular processes that on the one hand start gastrulation, but on the other prevent excessive signaling from happening. So how can we apply this knowledge to us humans? During embryo development, there is an important step in humans that is called neural tube closure, in which a gap in the future nervous system is sealed by cells migrating from the two sides. These cell movements, if you notice, are very similar to the movements that we saw in Drosophila gastrulation. Sometimes such movements are not carried out properly, and this results in a human disease called spina bifida, in which part of the nervous system remains exposed. On the other hand, occasionally, the cells gain the capacity to migrate too much, and this happens, for example, when cancer cells start metastasizing or colonizing other organs. So if we study these cellular processes in simple systems, such as fruit flies, we will get a better understanding of the basic developmental mechanisms, and perhaps this research will eventually suggest therapies for the related human diseases. This concludes our journey into the world of a gastrulating embryo. But before we move on to the next piece, I would like to answer a question posed to me by David. As a cell biologist, would you expect to find alien life composed of cells? Well, I will give an answer as an earthling cell biologist. I would answer it this way, more likely than not. Uh, what's the reason for my answer? Well, first of all, a boundary is needed to separate the inside of a living system from the outside world. And also, any living thing must still obey the laws of physics and chemistry. As an organism grows and uh, reaches a certain size, simple diffusion becomes a pretty inefficient way to carry the molecules across 
long distances. And one needs to subdivide this space into compartments. So cells fulfill these purposes perfectly. And that's why all living things, at least the, the ones that we're, we know of, are comprised of cells. And it is very likely that a similar subdivision would be encountered in uh, alien life as well. And now we will show a movement from the cellular dance ballet called The Fold. It follows the process of gastrulation through music and dance and even incorporates the Kurtz mutation at the end.
Thank you so much, Alexei, for your wonderful presentation this evening. I also want to thank uh, Meg again uh, for uh, choreographing that uh, recording uh, we showed you. Uh, Meg not only choreographed, but she danced, uh, and she was the uh, endodermic uh, layer of the, the cells uh, there in that valley. Uh, piano performed again by uh, Sophia Vastek. Uh, it's been a joy working with Alexei uh, over the years and putting together these uh, these pieces and slowly um, the artists and myself have been entering the world of Drosophila science um, uh, the, the fruit flies that is um, It's personally it's it's given me and a sense of appreciation for both the incredible Fragility and the incredible determination of life to continue and to go on It's been especially on my mind as my son and daughter have been born uh, over the last couple of years it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker. She joined us at the last minute and we're incredibly grateful for her for putting together this presentation at breakneck speed. Uh, we're about to leave planet Earth and journey to worlds unknown. I'm going to introduce our last speaker, a molecular astrophysicist at MIT, Dr. Clara Souza Silva. Thank you, David. Um... Please let me know if you cannot hear me or cannot see me, um, but otherwise I'll keep going. Um, that is all true. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I am an molecular astrophysicist at MIT, and I was really uh, keen on this question of unfolding life because I do spend a lot of time thinking about where life might unfold. We know it happened here on Earth, but elsewhere is not quite obvious. Figuring that out is very much my job, but it is a hard question to answer, particularly because we only have one single planet that we know has life. And extrapolating from a single data point is a really dangerous thing. So my favorite way to consider these, this question of finding life elsewhere is to think about a hypothetical alien civilization somewhere else in the galaxy looking for us. So imagine there's an alien astronomer looking up at her night sky searching for a sign that there's life out there. If she pointed their telescopes our way any time in the last hundred or so years, and then played around with a few universal radio frequencies, she and her colleagues would have heard indisputable signs of life. And that's because without even meaning to, we have been sending out radio signals for over a hundred years, and we've been sending out audiovisual signals since the first television broadcast of the 1920s. So any alien species that has been listening in at the right frequencies could have heard us. And by now, they would have a really good sense of who we are and what kind of TV we'd like to watch. But what about before radio and television? Were we just a, a silent planet? If those alien astronomers were looking at the Earth 200 years ago, what would they see? Well, let's say they were looking from the edge of the galaxy. From that perspective, our sun, so special to us, isn't special at all. It's just one of 300 billion bright white lights. But it is that white light, seemingly so fundamental and pure, that holds the key to unlocking the secrets of the planets hidden around these stars. And that's because white light is only pure until you crack it open. With a prism or a telescope, these alien astronomers could split our sun's light into its spectrum. And this is exactly what they would see. They would see the full rainbow of the sun's light, but most importantly, they would see that some of the light from the sun would have been absorbed by atoms and molecules within it and leave behind these tiny shadows or absorption lines. And that's because molecules behave in a really unique way. They still have to follow the laws of physics. But they're so tiny that the laws of physics they have to obey are the rules of the quantum world. And one of those rules is that they must absorb quantized amounts of energy and these correspond to specific wavelengths of light and different colors of the rainbow. Different stars have different compositions and different spectrum. And this is our sun's, our sun's spectral fingerprint. So those alien astronomers would look at this and using their universal knowledge of chemistry, know exactly which molecules and atoms were causing these absorption lines and figure out the composition of the sun. But if they were patient, fortuitously aligned, and they had slightly more advanced technology than we have now, they would notice that every year, a few much fainter shadows would appear and then disappear, and then a year later appear again, and then disappear. And these new lines would be due to the molecules in the atmosphere of the Earth as it crosses in front of the sun. 
that alien civilization can look at those new absorption lines and know exactly what molecules are present in our atmosphere and in what quantities. So if they were looking for life on Earth, they could, for example, look for the molecules that life produces. Molecules like methane, carbon dioxide, which are produced in large quantities by life, but even less abundant molecules like nitrous oxide and many others. But sadly, none of these molecules on their own would necessarily indicate life as they all have false positives, by which I mean known biological sources like volcanism that can also produce these molecules. In fact, most of the atmospheric gases that life loves are also produced by non-biological sources. And that's because these molecules are lovely, but thermodynamically speaking, they're not difficult to make. And so life makes these molecules, but other non-living processes make them as well. What this means is that detecting molecules like these in isolation on an alien planet wouldn't necessarily be an indication of life. So if that alien astronomer pointed their spectroscope at Earth and detected oxygen, they wouldn't be excited straight away because they would know that oxygen can be made without life. They would know, for example, that if our sun had different radiation, if our oceans were evaporating, if we had more CO2 and less volcanoes, or if we had less methane, then large amounts of oxygen could accumulate in the Earth's atmosphere without the intervention of life. But if they studied the context of our planet and our star, they would know that oxygen on Earth is very much a sign of life. What about if they looked at Earth before life evolved to produce so much oxygen? Could they still know that we had life? If these alien astronomers looked at Earth a long time ago, they would have looked at a very different planet and they would have seen very different signatures of life. Oxygen, for example, only became a good biosignature about halfway through the history of life on Earth. Until then, oxygen would have been a false negative for life, meaning not finding it does not mean there's no life. And before we had any life at all, we had a lot of CO2. So although it is a sign of life now, it was very much not a sign of life then. At that point, it would have been a false positive for life. I sometimes like to think that alien astronomers who may have looked at early Earth, and they would have been really disappointed to find a barren planet, and that they would find that this was a potentially habitable planet that had no life there. But I would hope that if these alien astronomers were good at their jobs, they could look for molecules like hydrogen cyanide or ethane, which aren't popular biosignatures now, but they were likely crucial for the origin of life. So they would be promising pre-biosignatures, and these astronomers would know that, and all they would have to do is just patiently wait for life to unfold on Earth. But what if they just weren't expecting to see life as it emerged on Earth? What if, like us, they were expecting to find life in their own image, and they're nothing like us? Well, Earth is a complex and layered planet, and life that thrives on it is not the only life that lives on it. Although life as we know it loves oxygen, there is a shadow biosphere throughout our planet that doesn't love oxygen so much. And that life produces my favorite exotic biosignature. This is phosphine. Phosphine is known for being an extremely toxic and frankly disgusting molecule for all life forms that use oxygen. So that's us and all the nice animals that you can think of. But there are ecosystems on Earth that don't like oxygen. Ecosystems such as those found in sewage, in marshlands, in rice fields, in lake sediments, the intestinal tract of fish, the intestinal tract of babies, the feces of penguins, the farts of badgers, and actually the intestines and excrements of many, many animals. These are rich ecosystems that are populated by anaerobic life that is able to thrive without oxygen. And here, phosphine is very welcome. It is only phosphine's relationship with oxygen reliant life that makes it so toxic. And at some point, life on Earth had to choose between phosphine and oxygen, and I'm very thankful that most of us chose oxygen. But for the majority of time that life existed on Earth, it didn't rely on oxygen. And there could be many other planets with life less oxygen-loving than our modern Earth, where phosphine would be a popular biosignature. Such a planet would feel like a tropical paradise for those living there, but it would most likely smell like an intestinal swamp to us. Don't worry, we would smell awful to them. And to make phosphine even cooler, it seems to have no false positives for life as long as it's found on terrestrial planets. It's so hard to make uh, that on habitable planets, only life will go through the trouble of producing it. And this is why, amongst other reasons, it is my favorite biosignature gas. 
But what if life, alien life, is an oxygen loving or phosphine loving? There must be other ways for life to unfold. My friend Janusz Petkowski, who actually was supposed to be speaking right now, and that's who I took over from, has a great paper about this. What he wrote about was that at some point, life on Earth chose thiol chemistry, and that is chemistry that relies on bonds between sulfur and hydrogen to keep our bodies and cells held together. But if life on Earth were to start over, would it have chosen the same thiol chemistry every time? Perhaps not. We could have, for example, chosen nitrogen sulfur chemistry. And if we had, we would be completely incompatible with the life that we are familiar with. In fact, if an Earth analog somewhere did choose NS chemistry and we got to meet them, we would instantaneously decompose one another. And this would be quite a disaster for galactic diplomacy. So that's just one example of how life could have unfolded on Earth. Life as we have come to think of it is likely only one island in the vast archipelago of possibilities for life. On Earth alone, life unfolded in many ways and in many places. And we can see how it could have unfolded very differently. And all this without knowing much about any planet beyond our own. So you may think that we have only one data point in the search for life because we have only one Earth. But as my friend and colleague Sarah Ruheimer puts it, Earth has been many planets. Moreover, Earth could have been many planets, and we can also study those paths not taken. Our planet has been teeming with life for billions of years, and every ecosystem throughout the history of the Earth has been sending out its own special combination of molecules into the atmosphere. An alien astronomer could study all of those molecules and map out our biosphere now and in every chapter of life on Earth, and we can do the same to them. Life has and will unfold in many ways throughout the galaxy, and we're only just beginning to understand it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. Uh, the more I learn about the uh, field of astrophysics moving at a breathtaking speed, uh, the more I feel certain that we'll discover alien life in our lifetimes, whether we'll be able to uh, visit it or not. Uh, and on that note, uh, I'm thrilled to introduce our final performer, uh, Beth Sterling, soprano, who's speaking to us live from Belmont. Hello, Beth. Hello, everyone. My name is Beth Sterling, and I'm the vocalist and assistant producer for the album Octave of Light, composed by David Ibbett of the Multiverse Concert Series. I'm really excited to perform for you tonight and to talk to you a bit about our musical process behind the piece you're about to hear, which is called Red Edge. I've gained so much excitement and respect for the science of exoplanets through working on this album, and I hope we can bring a little bit of that excitement to you through music. The piece you're about to hear has mostly been completed while social distancing in the past few months, collaborating back and forth online with sheet music updates and recordings. For all of the pieces on the album, the first version of the sheet music I received from David is somewhat bare bones compared to the detail he adds in later. So to start out, I usually only have my line and some of piano accompaniment to go on. For this piece, we rehearsed virtually to brainstorm the best interpretations for the vocal line. And then I recorded many takes of the segments of Red Edge at Home, which I then sent along to David to work with. While I will be singing the main melody live tonight, you'll hear some of these pre-recorded bits in a few places throughout the piece, especially at the end where I'm essentially harmonizing with myself. It's a very exciting moment for me to hear David's updates to the composition as he works and to hear my own line fully realized in the context of the piece once it's complete. It's always a little bit unexpected in a very good way and gives me a lot to work with as I rehearse for a live performance. The version of Red Edge I'll be performing for you tonight has pre-recorded piano, violin, and electronics over which I'll be singing live. Thank you and I hope you enjoy. With that, I'll hand it back to David. Uh, while Beth uh, gets ready to perform, uh, I have a couple of things to share. Uh, it's been hard. Uh, this, this is a piece that we've been making during the lockdown, and we've been sending files and recordings back and forth. We've never actually been in the same room uh, making this piece, uh, but somehow we, we all have to continue, and, and we make the best of it. Uh, so the song uh, is part of Octave of Light album, uh, which was backed by our amazing Kickstarter backers, um, and it's due to come out in November. We hope in person, uh, we don't know. If not, we will certainly be streaming it. 
Um, if you'd like to support our organization to do more programs like this uh, with uh, scientists, musicians, uh, performance artists, dancers, um, we're really open to the gamut uh, of science and art. Um, you can pre-order the album uh, on our website. That's multiverseseries.org. Uh, you'll see it uh, above me. Uh, and we're also going to um, support the Urbanity Dance Company that Meg Anderson is part of. Again, they're doing their absolute best to continue to uh, perform and to educate uh, during the times of lockdown. Uh, multiverseseries.org, where you can uh, pre-order the album. We also have a mailing list because we'd love to stay in touch uh, and learn what you thought um, and um, continue to provide you with, with programming. Uh, and in order to entice you to, to sign up, um, Ermgard Bischofberger has produced some gorgeous Zoom backgrounds, one of which I'm sporting here, which will be yours if you sign up. And if you've already signed up, um, send me a message and uh, I'll, I can send them to you. Um, so do stay in touch. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our final piece, uh, Red Edge, uh, with recorded violin by Amelia C. and live soprano Beth Sterling. Follow us. 
That's our show. Thank you so much, Beth, for your performance. And I'd like to invite all of our panelists and uh, artists, musicians, dancers to come uh, for a shared thank you. This is a little weird, but we're, we're clapping here. I'm clapping. Come, come on, everyone. So uh, a, a, final, a final thank you for our scientists, Omgar Bischoff Berger, Alexei Varaksa, and Clara Sousa Silva, uh, for Meg Anderson, a dancer choreographer, uh, Beth Sterling Soprano, and of course for James and Bethany at the Museum of Science uh, for making this event possible. Just a quick reminder, visit multiverseseries.org to check out our upcoming album and join us on the mailing list. We hope to do many more of these events and it's been an absolute joy to perform for you this evening. I'll now pass over to James at the museum. Thank you, David, and thank you to all of you. What an incredibly dynamic performance. I know how much work went into that, especially, you know, pulling this all together through Zoom, um, separated. Uh, and I know that the audience is, is joining me in a massive round of applause. I know that because our, our Q&A is just flooded with such amazing comments and, and um, appreciation to all of you for, for putting this on um, for everyone. So we do also have a couple of other questions as well that we'll just go through really quickly. Um, the first one, I think David really goes to you. Um, someone goes, how do you produce that music? So awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, it, it, it's, I'd call it mixed media. I mean, we, we use that for, you know, a visual artist use that, but I, you know, um, I use electronics, electronics a lot and re recorded sounds, synthesizers, but I'm classically trained, so I, I grew up playing trombone in orchestras and um, listening to symphonies. So combining uh, the, the classical influence with the electronics is a, is a passion of mine and combining all, all sorts of things. And um, how you mix it together, of course, it's, it's different every time. And that's why I like to work with uh, inspirational scientists because they provide a, a, an anchor for, for the music and a shape for the music to, uh, to emerge. That's wonderful. And how do the concepts, because this is, this is an ongoing series that you, you put on of different shows. So can you talk a little bit about how the concepts and the themes for each show come to be? So we're, we're always expanding the scope uh, and, and often we, we work with, with a new speaker and we 
build a show uh, around their work and, and really dive into a, a new topic uh, and, and visit it from a few different um, few different angles. Uh, this show is, is unique because we've, we've two speakers who, who, who are um, uh, old hands with us. They, they've, uh, they've been at multiple events um, and we're so grateful, Umgard and Alexei. Um, but we, we've now uh, got the opportunity, especially through Zoom, to do these kind of panel events where we take a larger question uh, and come at it with different fields. So we're looking to do more of that because it's been a lot of fun. I hope you uh, let us know if you agree or you want to get into one topic into um, greater detail. You know, we're doing both at the moment. That's wonderful. Um, someone commented they appreciated the scientific explanation behind the music and the graphics um, and tied to similar to that. I believe this question is for you, Ermgard, um, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, are the patterns related to fractals? Are they related to double diffusive instabilities associated with differing diffusivities of sugar and salt? I found it fascinating. My passion is the integration of the arts and sciences. Yeah, thanks so much. Sounds like a question from a scientist. So, um, yes, so some of the patterns of fractals. So the ones that I showed you that are very, very branched, uh, they are essentially belonging to the class of fractals, which essentially means that it's a pattern where I can zoom in and I see the same pattern as if I zoom out. I can zoom in even more, even more, even more, and I still get that same kind of uh, branching that I see on the large scale. And so in the limit of very, very strong branching, which we can achieve by going to two fluids, which have very different viscosities, and if we do the experiment on the conditions of high randomness, so without surface tension, we exactly get towards the fractal limit. Yes. And so the second question is about a different type of instability. These uh, double diffusive convections, which also lead to fingering-like structures. You sometimes see them when you have fresher water that gets close to salt water. For example, when you have an iceberg in an ocean starting to melt slowly, you might see these uh, fingering-like structures, which are another type of fluid instability. Uh, other competing forces that drive their growth. In this case, it's a competition between the density difference between the fresher water and the saltier water, and the gravitational uh, and the viscosity of the two two fluids or the the, the two the, the two mixtures. And so it's a related fluid instability. It's something we also study in the lab or related phenomenon that we study and which holds many, many secrets that we are still trying to unveil. So thank you for the question. Great. Um, and lots of comments about how wonderful it was to, and this is what I love about this work is, is how art and science and technology are fused together um, in really brilliant ways. So can we hear a little bit about the creative process and the collaboration between artists and scientists and how, what that process was and, and how that came together, maybe from Meg and Beth and Alexei on the pieces that you've all collaborated on? So um, for me, I will go ahead and say that this whole process began uh, with David reaching out to myself and explaining a little bit about what he was thinking and then meeting Alexei and going right into his lab. Um, and he showed us, you know, on the microscope and he, that awesome background, which I think someone commented they want uh, Alexei's background. Yes. His background's awesome, right? So he uh, showed us these cells and then like dyed them different colors and then sent us pictures. And I was so inspired just by that and all of the different uh, vivacious colors and um, even more inspired by realizing that all of that is happening inside myself and that, um, you know, like cells are really dancing. If you look at their movements in some of those videos that you saw, it really looks like they're dancing. They're choreographing and they're making this beautiful movement. And then to realize that that's happening inside of ourselves, even while we're just sitting here is a really humbling experience. Um, and so 
having all of that information and being taught so carefully by Alexei and then also having a conversation with David about how the music should sound. And we all just kind of got into a room together and had a big brainstorm. And it was this really beautiful meeting of the minds um, where we all come from very different backgrounds, but where our different uh, experiences collide and how could we make something interesting with how that came together. So that was my experience. It was a really wonderful, wonderful experience. Yeah, uh, Meg has put it very nicely. And by the way, uh, if you want a, a background, you have to talk to David because he spent literally three or four minutes in the lab and was able to produce these uh, beautiful pictures of cells. So he's a very quick learner. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to, uh, to say that it has been an incredible collaboration for me as we sit for countless hours behind the microscopes, looking at these cells and looking at these embryos, um, I, I, I can't help but think about maybe sounds and colors that can be associated with, with that. And as soon as I learned about uh, David's project, I, I was very excited to, to come aboard uh, because, and, and I think David has achieved something um, really unique because I think the music very organically mixes with these beautiful biological structures and, and, and also uh, mixing it together with the dance creates a, a completely new dimension for all media, for, for the scientific um, component for music and, and, and for dancing. So it, it has been absolutely fascinating to, uh, to be on this uh, journey. Great, and Beth, any any insights from your collaboration? Yes, I wanted to add as well. Um, I started this whole process again by David reaching out to me. Um, we're actually colleagues at Yamaha Music School, which is how this all started. Um, and it actually just started with him asking me to record just a short sample of something. Um, and our whole album kind of, yeah, it kind of evolved from there. Um, I mean, it's been super fascinating. So for the Octave of Light album, um, David collaborated with the Boy of Gould um, to learn more about the science of exoplanets. Um, so, you know, a lot of that is beyond what my brain likes to comprehend, but it's been super fascinating to learn about it. I didn't know that we had even discovered as many exoplanets as we had. Um, and just trying to convey that same sense of excitement and wonderment from sort of a layman's perspective has been my goal in performing the works. Um, it's just been a great experience. Wonderful. And Clara, so much um, love for your presentation. People um, are raving and someone asked, and I'm curious about this too, uh, what's the difference between an astrobiologist and a molecular astrophysicist? Is the overlap only marginal or are the terms interchangeable? Um, that's a great question. Molecular astrophysicists have been going on for a long time, but usually they focus in molecules found in between the stars. A few years back, I actually think some molecular astrophysicists found um, sugar, alcohol, and citric acid in between the stars, which is all the ingredients you need to make a margarita in space, in between the stars. Um, so this is an old career. While well, astrobiology is very much a, a more recent enterprise, um, so I just started off as someone looking at one molecule, phosphine, and now I look at how that molecule can maybe mean life elsewhere and how other molecules could mean life. But so the overlap is actually quite small and it's, you know, it's a very small field. I think I, I know them all. <laughs> Great, thank you. And so, you know, David, can you talk about any future plans? I know it's hard right now, we're in limbo, but are there any upcoming projects people are really curious about? Um, yes. How else they can connect? And, and I think for everyone else too, just a follow up, David, sorry. Um, after that, some of you answered this too, but I wanna make sure that everyone gets this information. Where can people support all of the amazing artists and, and scientists? Are there websites or a place that they can stream your music? make sure that everyone sort of plugs where more information can be found so people can connect with you. So a lot of things are gathered on uh, multiverseseries.org. We, we have the, the listings of all the speakers uh, and musicians, uh, composers we've worked with, and we try to keep a good um, archive, of everything, archive of everything we do. Um, so you can, uh, you can visit and um, 
if you want to support us uh, we're a non-profit organization and uh, we get our funding project by project and we're always trying to grow and, and reach more people so um, we very much appreciate the support especially now that we're adapting it um, to work in this this new format um, let me see was there another question in, there was another question in there is there anyone oh, upcoming else? shows upcoming yeah. shows yes so we have a lot we have a full season plan for next year uh, but we're not sure uh, if it's going to be in person or not uh, you know we're, we're waiting um, for some news uh, we in we're supposed to be uh, back uh, in October we're going to return to the reef uh, those of you who, who saw um, reef music uh, with Sarah Davies um, um, coral marine biologist at, at uh, BU uh, we're going to revisit her work uh, two years on and look at coral bleaching. Uh, and if the plight of coral has changed uh, since two years ago, it was looking pretty uh, bleak then, but we'll we, we'll find out. Um, we're hoping for that to be a public gathering, uh, but we're prepared for it not to be uh, and to have to stream it. And then, of course, the, the album, uh, the Exoplanet Octave of Light, comes out in November. And we, we have release shows planned, uh, but again, we're ready to stream it. We have to be quite adaptable uh, and of course if you want to hear from us um, as we uh, make these decisions uh, you can join our mailing list and we'll, we'd love to stay in touch with you. Great and Meg and Beth I saw you had put in websites in there do you want to plug those areas uh, quickly? Sure um, I have my own personal website for my singing it's just bethsterling.com and um, for dance I I'm honored to be the artistic associate at Urbanity Dance. We are also a nonprofit in the south end of Boston, and you can check out urbanitydance.org for all of our class offerings. And right now we're holding weekly Instagram live adult dropping classes. So if you're interested in starting to get yourself moving or to pick up some dance, your living room is a really great place to start and no one can see you, which is great. Um, so check out our Instagram handle. It's at Urbanity Dance and we have weekly uh, classes there as well. Wonderful. Well, that seems like a perfect way to end an amazing night. Thank you all again. This was truly a triumph to pull this off uh, digitally and virtually. We thank you all. Um, as David said, I hope for many more collaborations between our teams, both virtually and on site. So stay tuned for more information on that end. And I just want to thank the Lowell Institute one more time for making tonight possible and all of you for watching and joining us. We thank you. Uh, hope that you will keep coming back and checking out future stuff. And until then, um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you soon. Have a good night. <laughs>